Hello, and welcome to Chad's ADHD 365 podcast. This episode is sponsored by Landmark College. Visit landmark.edu to learn more about the associate and bachelor's degree programs offered at their Southern Vermont campus, as well as the fully online options, including associate degrees in general studies and business and online dual enrollment courses for high school students. Welcome to ADHD 365. I'm Karen sampson Bachman, Director of Marketing at Chad. And today we're talking with learning disabilities consultant, Elizabeth Hamblett, about the transition to college for students who learn differently. Elizabeth C. Hamblett has worked both ends of the college transition. She began her career as a high school special education teacher and then began working at the college level in the late 1990s. She is now at her third university, working in a disability services office as a learning consultant. She authored the book, Seven Steps to College Success, A Path for Students with Disabilities, third edition. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, we are delighted to have you. So our first question is, how is college different from high school for people who do learn differently? My goodness, how much time do you have? (laughs) Take your time. Share this with us. Obviously, very similar being academically focused, but I think the environment is really different. And somebody recently, I can't remember if I was reading somebody's very good blog post or something, talking about how challenging it can be to mimic the conditions of college while students are still in high school, right? To try to get them ready. First of all, literally in high school, in a lot of cases, you are just in that building all day. You move between floors, perhaps, or certainly between hallways, but often you're not supposed to be outside. For some students, the more they move away from that building, the more opportunities there are to be distracted, to get on to other things. Just the basics of, for a lot of students, getting up in the morning is somewhat aided by the fact that other people in the house are getting up at the same time. Sometimes parents are assisting students with that. That is not something that disability services offices or residential staff does for students with ADHD. Some students benefit from being in the same classes five days a week. That repetition can be really helpful. I think the rhythm of that, too, just somehow can be soothing in its way. But at a lot of colleges, there are classes that meet two times a week for an hour and a half or three hours a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so it's a lot of organizational strategies needed. We don't do a daily assignments often. Again, classes aren't meeting on a daily basis. And so for students who benefit from knowing every day after class they're going to have to do this, it requires being more on top of things. Professors don't prompt students about what's in the syllabus all the time. Students need to get into the learning or course management system and see what's in the syllabus and be aware for themselves of what's due. You know, professors don't always start or end a class by saying, and don't forget to turn this in. They might, but it's not the kind of thing that students can count on. They don't have frequent tests. Sometimes it's a midterm and a final exam only that will determine your entire grade. And so that requires that kind of task persistence of going to class every week and keeping up with the readings and making sure that if you didn't understand something, you go seek help because that first exam can be a real eye opener. And then you only have one more chance to fix it. We don't typically do extra credit. So all of these things that some of our students are accustomed to having picked their grade up or at least maintained it at a certain level may be absent for them. They have to read entire books sometimes in a week with no comprehension questions. And so they have to figure out for themselves what strategy to use to get themselves through. So thinking on those strategies, how does ADHD really affect those college students when we're talking academics and we're talking socially? Oh, boy. And certainly no two people with ADHD are like they all have a different levels of symptomatology. And so it can vary. But certainly one of the things you'll find everybody commenting on is time management skills. Whereas in high school, they're usually in a building 35 hours a week. In college, they're only in classes 12 to 15 hours a week. A lot of the learning is supposed to be something that they do on their own. And that's why there's so much reading. Professors aren't always there to 
teach them everything. So they need to be thoughtful about how they use their time. The whole self-monitoring piece, have you been staring at your blank screen for half an hour and the time is going by? They have to be responsible for themselves. If you know going back to the dorm after class is a recipe for distraction because your friends are going to be there, then instead of going there, you go to the library. And so it's all on students to take on all of these responsibilities. One thing that not a lot of people talk about, but because I work at the college level, is if they are approved by the Disability Services Office, which we'll just abbreviate to DS for the rest of this, for any kind of exam accommodations at a lot of schools, they have to fill out a form anytime they have a test and get it to us often within two weeks of the exam date. Because unlike in high school, we are not in touch with their professors. Professors aren't responsible for letting us know that they have an exam coming up. And so that's a paperwork thing to apply just to get housing at all. There are deadlines. So it's a lot of managing emails. So with all of that, and we're dealing with ADHD, is ADHD considered a disability for college students? This is a lot to juggle. So let's be clear. Disability services offices serve all sorts of disabilities. And I've seen some people claiming, unfortunately, online that it's only for what we now call apparent visibilities or visible disabilities that we can observe. But that's not true. We serve students with all sorts of non-apparent disabilities, mental health disabilities, ADHD, learning disabilities. So stating that, yes, we do that. What some students may find is, and this is going to sound strange, but it's a phrase that I hear repeated in my field, is that having a disability does not always equal or having a diagnosis does not always equal a need for accommodations. And I know that's very confusing to people. And if you're listening and you get upset, let me see if I can further explain. ADHD, like a lot of things, is a spectrum. There are students with mild ADHD. There are students with severe ADHD. The disability laws in place, which are Section 504, subpart E, which is important because the part that students are covered by in high school is subpart D, which is why 504 plans are not valid after students graduate from high school, which I know is a subject of a lot of confusion, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So each of those laws actually defines what it means to be a person with a disability. And in the wording of the law, and I'm paraphrasing, is that the person experiences a substantial limitation or is substantially limited in one or more daily life functions. And so sometimes we look at the documentation, which is the paperwork that students submit to us when they register. And this is only once they're admitted to and enroll and then register with the Disability Services Office at a college, that we might look at their documentation and not think that it shows that substantial need. So while, yes, we do accommodate students with ADHD, it's possible, and I can't tell you the probability, that some students who have been accommodated previously may not be found eligible by their college. So you're talking about documentation, and that leads me to wonder what documentation is required if a student has ADHD, and is there a recommended timeline for preparing all of that documentation? So the challenge for families is that every college gets to determine its own documentation requirements, and so they can vary widely from college to college. For some students, it will just be a letter from whoever is treating them. I recognize not all students are getting treated. It could be a letter or form by whoever identified their ADHD. Some schools use forms to prompt these professionals to provide them with a certain amount of information. But there are a number of schools that even though students weren't required to have it previously, require them to have what's called a psychoeducational evaluation, the kind of testing that we do for learning disabilities where we test cognitive ability and academic skills. Some schools may go farther than that. So it's the only way to know, and students can do this for any college that interests them, is to go on our websites, navigate to the Disability Services Office site, find the documentation requirements, and then they'll know what each school requires. If they can't find it for some reason, they should call the office. This is not the kind of thing that we hide. It should be there, but trying to get stuff onto a university website is complicated. We're not in control of it. And so sometimes maybe 
changes. They've been waiting to make changes or they've just not been able to get everything up that they want. When to start looking at this, in my opinion, it's a great idea as students are adding colleges to their list to have a look at each school's documentation requirements and take some notes about that. And that way they may find that none of the schools that they're interested in require anything more than what they already have. They don't need anything updated and then they can just rest easy. They may discover if they're looking at five different colleges that all of those colleges require testing, in which case it could be a good idea to go get that testing while they are as soon as they can, assuming they really are going to apply to these schools and that will be necessary. I know some people are very worried about how recent documentation can be. Again, that's all over the map. Some schools will say it has to be, and I'm using air quotes here, current or recent without defining that with a certain number of years. I apologize for having to say it's just the way it is. I'm here to give you the facts so that you can be informed and hopefully feel empowered. I'm not here to explain why we do things the way we do. I just want you to know about it. With all of gathering the documentation and thinking this through, how can parents and educators help high school students who are learning differently to determine if college is the right choice for them in the first place? I think it really starts with what interests students. When I was writing the book and often when I'm talking to people, I hear myself saying that if students are interested in college, we need to start talking to them, you know, in eighth grade, just because the planning for high school should have that goal in mind. And I hate thinking and saying that. The reason it matters is that there are certain accommodations that are not commonly available in college. And so if a student starts high school with numerous supports, a lot of adults doing things for them, to me, the goal should be by senior year for them to be really pretty independent and have strategies that they can use on their own to be functioning. And so it's a dial it back to ask an eighth grader, hey, what do you want to do in four years? I think it's, it's not fun. And For a lot of them, it may just be the default of, yeah, I think I want to go to college, which is great because also some of what we're talking about is preparation for transition to the workplace too. Maybe not writing an essay, a 10-page research paper on your own, but utilizing technology that's helpful, that time management piece, you know, learning what you need. Do you need to take notes every time your boss gives you directions because you will not remember them as soon as you go back to do that task? So I think getting a realistic sense of what happens at college and doesn't can help to inform the planning for students while they are in high school. And again, no matter what they want to do after high school, The goal should be to move toward independence. I'm not suggesting freshman year you remove all their supports. I've heard that argument too. Take them off the IEP. Take them off the 504. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm saying is everybody involved needs to have a look at what is the pile of supports we're doing, if indeed it is a pile. What of these are likely to be available to them in the next place? And for those that are not, how do we move them toward being able to do without them? So you mentioned the realistic expectations and, as you said, having things in place. So how can parents and educators assist students in selecting the most suitable college for them and for students who have diverse learning needs? Are there specific programs or majors that cater to students with diverse learning needs that would be better for them? So that's a great question. And I get this question like, is there a best? college for students with learning needs. And again, we're back to everybody's an individual, right? And so what makes one school a really good fit for one student with ADHD perhaps makes it not for them. So when I was doing interviews for the book, I talked to disability services directors and I said, what do you think about what makes a school a good fit? Because we all hear this advice that We, meaning people working at the higher ed level, hear others saying, well, you got to look at the Disability Support Services Office. And that is part of it. But it has to be a school that's a good fit in general. And in that way, that search should look like it does for any student looking at colleges. The size is important. Now, for students with ADHD in particular, 
size may be something that they want to look for, something small, because they want to get to know their professors. They don't want to be in large lecture classes. Or they might like the stimulation. They may think that a school that's very small does not have enough to offer them for activities. So these are important. Some schools have largely lecture classes for your first couple of semesters, and maybe that doesn't work for them, or maybe that's great for them. I think there are some schools, they run on trimesters or quarters instead of semesters. And again, I don't have stats like it seems to me the majority of schools do. So in a shorter term, you take fewer classes. Now, those classes move faster. For some students, that's going to be a great match. These are things that they can start to think about. If they have a major in mind, they should make sure the school that they attend has that major. Because again, it doesn't matter how supportive they feel our disability services office is if they can't study what they want. All of that is really important. And they can do some research on our offices. If you go to my YouTube channel, I have a video that I recorded of myself navigating through a site and trying to look at what schools offer that might go beyond the minimum. Also looking at what other supports there are. So sometimes students come to us and they want, for instance, academic coaching. They've heard that this could be useful. So what listeners need to know is that is not a disability accommodation. We are not required to provide such services. Some schools might do so, but they might not do it through DS. They might do it through the academic support center that's available to everybody. And it might be an upperclassman rather than a professional, whatever kind of professional you would be thinking of. And that's not to say it it wouldn't be helpful, but these are the kinds of things that they can look for, too. And so I think people tend to focus on what's the disability services office like. Keep in mind, a lot of students, as long as they can get the accommodations they want, they don't really care about us. And I do not take that personally. But what I mean is they just want to have their accommodations. They're not really interested in a relationship with us. And so supportive means different things to different people. For some students, it means I got what I asked for and we roll. For others, it's I want to have them do social events for us. I want to have a check-in once a week. And even if we don't advertise that anecdotally, I can say that I have spoken to colleagues who will have an opportunity to meet with a student once a week if they want to. And they just have to ask. This episode is sponsored by Landmark College, a community designed exclusively for students who learn differently, including students with ADHD, autism, a learning disability such as dyslexia, or executive function challenges. Landmark College champions a strength-based model that provides neurodivergent students with the skills and strategies they need to succeed in life, academically, and socially. Comprehensive support is built into the college's living learning model, and students enjoy a vibrant campus life with sports teams, social clubs, and programmed activities that help them build confidence and make lifelong friends. And don't forget about the therapy dogs, which have their own office hours for walks and playtime with students. Visit landmark.edu to learn more about the associate and bachelor's degree programs offered at their Southern Vermont campus as well as the fully online options, including associate degrees in general studies and business and online dual enrollment courses for high school students. How do colleges then ensure an inclusive and a supportive environment for all students, whether it's through DS or through academic services? Again, I think inclusive is in the eye of the beholder. So just to be really clear, because this is an important point to make, absolutely every college in the country has to follow these laws that we just talked about, 504 and the ADA. And the only way for them to be exempt is to have three things be true. So the first is that it would have to be a school that didn't take any money from the federal government. So that includes Pell Grants for students with financial needs or federal student loans. That includes GI Bill money from people coming out of the military, federal research dollars. And so 
literally almost every college in the country has to do that. I've never seen an official list out of the U.S. Department of Ed. I had seen one somebody in my field put together years ago. It only had eight colleges on it out of the more than 4,000 two- and four-year schools in the country. If that is true, the school would still have to be a private religious institution. So that's two and three. In that way, every school is inclusive, meaning they are providing disability accommodations. Some schools record every lecture. So that is something that for some students, it would feel inclusive. I was just at a session at a conference last week about disability cultural centers, and that can make students feel more welcome. Sometimes the Disability Services Office itself just organizes some um, Pride Month or awareness activities. I was at a session on that recently. So again, when we talk about this stuff, I think sometimes it's my impression that it's the adults, the educators and the parents talking about these things. What the research shows us and my experience in working with college and grad students (laughs) since the late 1990s is that for a lot of them, they just want their accommodations. Sometimes if there's a free service, they will take advantage of it. Not to say that they don't want to be identified. It's just not that big a part of their experience. Well, you're mentioning these accommodations. And so I have a double question for you. Are there specific accommodations or supports available for students with ADHD at different colleges? And are there accommodations that are not available? That's a great question. First, actually, I want to make this point because sometimes people will say to me, well, Elizabeth, what kind of accommodations do students with ADHD get? And again, in my experience, that's not generally how we do it. We don't do it by category, if you will, because we're often looking at that documentation and looking to see specifically where the student has that limitation that needs accommodation. And so we don't have like the National Center for Educational Statistics doesn't collect this information, but there was a big longitudinal study that was done in the early 2000s and they followed these students for 10 years. Among the most commonly received accommodations were things like extended test time. Now, it was also a big, steep drop off from there to some other things that students received. And what I want to say is this. It's a good opportunity to start talking about the vocabulary that we use at the college level. And so students come out of high school, understandably, and they just say, I know I had extended time. Sometimes they will say to us, I had unlimited time or untimed exams. That's what I want in college. We generally can speak for all my 4,000 colleagues. We'll give it a specific amount of time. At my office, we use decimal points, 1.5. My colleagues call it 150%, which means for a two-hour exam, the student would get three hours. Now, for some students, understandably, as with chocolate, more they think is better. And so they'll ask for double time. So there are no stats I've seen on who gets time and a half versus double time, but the bar may be high er to get double time. There are things like reduced distraction sites. So again, vocabulary, we cannot guarantee a distraction-free environment. That's literally not possible. So we will instead offer the student a reduced distraction site where perhaps they're in a different room with a proctor often and a few other students, but maybe not as many as were in their classes. You can learn this vocabulary by looking at college disability services sites and starting to see how we list those accommodations Ability to use your laptop to take notes. Sometimes professors have a no laptop policy and we can, if we find the student eligible and that's important, override that. Permission to record those lectures. That is something we can do. There are no stats on this that are current and about who's getting like a human note taker copies of a peer's notes versus permission to record. And the reason I think it's important we don't have current stats on that is Things have changed. I can see in my online community of professionals, that's changed a lot in the last 10 years. As AI comes in and becomes really useful, some of my colleagues are giving note takers to only students who literally physically cannot take notes. And for everybody else, they may offer them for no fee, a copy of 
what's called Otter AI, which is a transcription software, or Glean, G-L-E-A-N, which is a different one. So this is something, again, we can start to talk to students about if they are getting notes from somebody else in high school, I am not saying to take those away. But what I am saying is it's a really good idea to make sure students are taking some notes of their own and maybe somebody can provide them with instruction on how to take better notes. A lot of their neurotypical peers don't take very good notes or don't feel really good about their notes. That is just something that that's true for everybody. So they shouldn't expect that. And one thing I always try to make sure to mention is not commonly approved. And in this longitudinal study, 72% of the students had additional time to complete assignments. And in any kind of post-secondary school, which means career and technical ed, two-year schools and four-year schools, 6% of students were approved for that. So time management strategies for long-term assignments, these are the things we need to get them used to while they are in high school. Because to me, the more they practice this stuff, they may not be perfect at it. They may be finishing that paper at the last minute. Again, some of their neurotypical peers are going to do the same. But if they have some experience doing these things and meeting those deadlines, especially knowing they may not get the extensions, my hope is that they'll feel more confident going into college because they will have had some real life experience doing those things. So I think it's important. With all of this, what are some of the specific difficulties students are facing when it comes to navigating the college's disability services office and understanding how to document the requirements in order to receive the services you just mentioned? So again, they can go online and they can look at what the college that they're planning to attend requires and make sure that they have that. Again, if the school requires some kind of evaluation they've never had before, one of the things they can do is, and I always recommend this, if the student is not sure whether the school will accept their documentation, they should send it in anyway and ask them how long it will take them to review that so that they know whether or not they're going to have to rush to get something done. Now, rush to get something done, I just said, and I'm using air quotes, they're not in control of when they can find somebody to do that assessment. Sometimes waiting lists are long for people who are very good at that stuff. And so some schools will grant temporary accommodations. And again, it's something that students can ask for. I can't promise you that they will, and they're not required to if the student's documentation doesn't meet the requirements. But this is all part of that self-advocacy that we think is so important, right? Making sure that they ask. If a parent is concerned about their child's successful transition to college from high school and that transition without their involvement, is there anything they can do to support their student at the college level? I think that what they can do is serve as a coach. Whether your student has ADHD or is neurotypical, a lot of advice from the experts is before your student goes, sit down with them at the school website, poke around and see what are the forms of support that are available to them. Make sure that they know there is a counseling center, there's an academic support center, there might be a writing center, all of those things. One of the things I haven't even talked about is the emotional regulation piece of executive functioning. I think we need to, first of all, normalize the idea that college can be challenging. Sometimes students are accustomed to achieving all really strong grades in high school, and then they get to college and they think, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. This is really hard. And that's not the case. It's meant to be challenging. It's a new environment. Again, it's less structured. You're doing more learning on your own. You can do a weekly check-in with your student and just say, look, how are things going? And if you're not comfortable telling me, does this say to you that you should probably go get some help? Here's where you can go for that. And it's interesting. I was just on a podcast episode for the podcast I co-host. And the main host of that podcast, it's called College Parent Central, is a long experienced professor and an academic advisor. And she and her colleague suggest a communication schedule and not going around that. And I think that's very interesting. We were laughing that because when we were in college for me in the 1980s, if you wanted to call your parents, you had to go back to your dorm room. And we tried to call on Sundays because the rates were cheaper. But students have our access to us at all times. And so I think they suggested 
waiting to answer that phone call or waiting for the text because we do need students to start working things out on their own and tolerating some discomfort. I know for some parents, their students have arrived at this place after many years of struggle and sometimes literal failure. But you just literally can't always support them every moment or be there. And so getting them to tolerate some of that frustration and figure out. And instead of saying, well, I'm going to call. And again, professors will not always take phone calls. There are no stats on that, but just I've heard stories. And parents aren't really in a position to call administrators. And so I think just trying to make sure you help your student figure out the appropriate way to address a challenge, figure out what resources are available to them, who on the campus might be an advocate to them. Can their academic advisor help them out with somebody? Disability services help them out. But just to, we're not saying you have to do everything on your own, but you got to pick the right resources. Though, again, the more we do that in high school too, the better able they will be to do that when they transition. As a student is approaching high school, before a student begins college, what sort of boundaries, responsibilities, expectations should parents and students put in place during that time? And again, it needs to be developmentally appropriate. You're going to do differently with your high school freshman than you will with your senior. So starting to look at those daily tasks of what do they call it? ADAs, activities of daily living and ADLs, I guess. So is your student getting themselves up? I know that's a challenge for some students and maybe it's not appropriate freshman year, but by senior year, do they know how long it really takes them to get ready to go out the door? And if so, they need to back up that schedule and start sooner. I was just reading some of Seth Perler's information in preparation for something I'm doing with him. Organization of your materials. I am not Martha Stewart. I do not clean out my purse every day, but a schedule of two to three times a week, dumping that backpack out. When I work with grad and undergrad students at the university, when I see your backpack overflowing with papers, I know I'm dealing with a really stressed out student because I've yet to meet the student who says, I can put my fingers on that, no problem. And they're not carrying a lot of paper anymore. But when they can't put their hands, they didn't bring their laptop with them. So therefore, we can't do certain things. That stuff is interfering with their ability to be effective. Organization of materials. If you are constantly bringing stuff to the school for them, figuring out this many more times for the rest of this term, what are you going to do? And we have to engage them in this process, right? What's going to work for them? A lot of them have that cell phone in their pocket at all times. I press the side button on my phone and say, remind me at 11 tomorrow morning to do blank. You still have to do it at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. But showing them that there are tools that they're already using that could be useful to them, too. You have mentioned so much that is so very helpful. Is there anything, though, that I have not asked that you'd like to share with us that would be helpful for our audience? I'd like to offer some optimism. I don't expect you to ask about that, but students with ADHD and other learning disabilities are going to college and they are being successful. I want them to have that confidence and I think parents will be less anxious about it too and more confident. The more we give students that chance while they're in high school to demonstrate and practice that independence. So there are lots of skills we can be teaching them as we go modeling how you write an email to somebody. And that sounds insignificant, but it is. I help students with emails all the time. The importance of brevity, the importance of tone and things like that. And so we can show them how we would do it the next time, have them compose it and give them some feedback. And then the next time they do it on their own. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities to get your student ready and they're not always going to be perfect. But one of the things we forget is a lot of their neurotypical peers aren't perfect either. We have a tendency to be very focused because we're so concerned about our students. But we all have to fall down and pick ourselves up from different experiences. And that also builds their resilience. This has been a lot of information. Where can our listeners learn more about you, learn more about the resources you may have? So on my website, which is ldadvisory.com, that's L-D-A-D-V-I-S-O-R-Y.com. 
you will find there my blog. There are dozens of posts about preparation, about accommodations, about documentation. From there, you can find the link to my YouTube channel where I have lots of videos available. Some of them I produced sharing the same kinds of stuff that's in the posts for people who'd rather watch than read but also webinars that colleagues have done for me. There's one on assistive technology. There's one that two educational consultants did on college readiness. So there's lots and lots of free information. And also the link to under media to the podcast interviews I've done to which I'll add this one. But if they really want a deep dive and they really want a thorough explanation of the laws and how things change, what students need to be ready to do, the college application and search process, what admissions directors said, and much more detail about accommodations. My book is the most thorough resource that I have. It's called Seven Steps to College Success, A Pathway for Students with Disabilities. At the time of this recording, only the hardcover is out, but the paperback comes out September 1st, and folks can pre-order that. So I also have two on-demand webinars and a six-page concise guide. So lots of opportunities to learn. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. This episode is sponsored by Landmark College. Visit landmark.edu to learn more about the associate and bachelor's degree programs offered at their Southern Vermont campus, as well as the fully online options, including associate degrees in general studies and business and online dual enrollment courses for high school students. Thank you for listening to another episode of Chad's ADHD 365 podcast. 